This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Take a step back in time and discover old Florida cuisine at Marsh Landing Restaurant in Felsmere. Enjoy delicacies such as frog legs, gator tail, catfish, and swamp cabbage, or enjoy the more traditional cuisine like hand-cut Angus steaks, ribs, and seafood. Join us for breakfast with a southern flair featuring sweet potato pancakes, biscuits and gravy, and much more. Planning a party? Marsh Landing's private dining room can accommodate groups from 8 to 80 people. While you're visiting, enjoy the historic pictures, artifacts, and stories that line the walls. Marsh Landing is truly a unique experience. Marsh Landing Restaurant, 44 North Broadway in historic Felsmere, or visit marshlandingrestaurant.com. Marsh Landing, old Florida cuisine at its best. Know the genius in you, where in a single moment you can recognize your brilliance and change your life. This is a transformational hour that covers an array of topics that demonstrate how individuals use their native talents, as shown in their name, to look at the ordinary in extraordinary ways. Albert Einstein once said that everybody's a genius. Why would one of the smartest people on the planet declare that everyone is a genius unless he knew that to be true? I'm Sharon Lynn Wyeth, and in each weekly show, you'll hear the fascinating ways other people discovered the genius in them and what they were able to accomplish. At the end of each show, you'll hear clues on how you can recognize your own innate genius. All over the world, people have many, many diverse interests. And in that vein, people want to know how highly successful people have managed to achieve their genius mindset by utilizing the gifts that are seen in their name, utilizing nameology science the study of the placement of the letters in a name to determine someone's personality predispositions. Our expert tonight is Joseph John Dewey, who has developed his genius in the area of writing. JJ, as his friends call him, is a prolific writer, having published numerous books and literally thousands of articles. He is read by people around the world and very well respected for his philosophical viewpoints and his engaging writing style. JJ has been a student of philosophy, metaphysics and religion most of his life and has taught numerous classes and seminars on a variety of avant-garde subjects. JJ has always thought that this was a symbol of his life's work, which is associated with the middle way. In fact, one of his many books, The Lost Key of the Buddha, discusses the mystery behind the middle way as taught by Buddha. Dewey's appeal is in part contributed to his tendency to examine both sides of an issue in an attempt to find the truth which lies somewhere between the two extremes. He's always asked questions about the unknown and sought answers to questions that others often dare not even ask. JJ recalls one of his earliest memories in life when he was about three years old and wondered where he was before he was born. No one directed his thinking on this subject for it was just in his nature to wonder about things. Besides, others thought him way too young to engage in conversations concerning those topics. As a teenager, he was very interested in a variety of topics. For interest, instance, in science, he made a lot of rockets. He was the only kid in school with his own stargazing size telescope. He also learned to analyze handwriting and the art of hypnosis. He joined an orthodox religion that was not a good fit for his unconventional thinking patterns, and thus, as an adult, he chose a different path. However, that early Orthodox training instilled in him an interest in the scriptures, as well as the spiritual side of life. As a kid, he wanted to be a scientist, but later changed his main interest to spirituality due to his introduction to the idea of reincarnation. Even though he found scriptures that verified the idea of reincarnation, he was puzzled as to why reincarnation was strongly rejected by the churches. He has continued to learn through studying and voraciously reading, as well as receiving impressions 
impressions on principles and teachings through personal reflections and time spent contemplating. In J.J. Dewey's book series, The Immortal, the author draws from many true life experiences to create a story that presents unique and mystical teachings in a way that captivates the imagination. What is true and what is fiction? That is for the reader to determine, as J.J. books encourage contemplation and thinking for oneself. Welcome to Know the Name, Know the Genius in You radio show, J.J. Well, that was a pretty good rundown, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, your name indicates that you have wisdom be beyond your chronological years and that you're here to lead and not to follow anybody else, that you can gain ideas from others, but that you're here to forge a new path. And that's a lot of what your writing does in a most remarkable way. So what I'd really like to know, and I'm sure all of our listeners want to know is, how did you know it was time for you to write? I mean, material has a degree of sensitivity, and sometimes the market's not ready for you. So how did you know it was time? Well, it wasn't so much that I knew. It's the fact that uh, when I was about 16 years old, I just uh, started reading uh, quite a bit about that time. Before then, I never read my first, I never read any book at all until I had an accident where a rocket blew up in my hand. And I was in the hospital with nothing to do, and there I read my first book was about, and ironically, it was about rockets. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, uh, after I started reading, I become interested in uh, in writing, and so I uh, started uh, writing. I wrote some poetry and some fiction and sent it off with enthusiasm, thinking it was the best thing that anyone had ever written in eternity. And I uh, got all kinds of rejection slips, so uh, that kind of discouraged me temporarily. But uh, it, never, it never extinguished the fire to uh, write down, write, to become a writer. Well, you've published a lot of things that have not been written anywhere else. Um, stay tuned to Know the Name, Know the Genius in You, which can also be heard on knowthename.com. After the break, we'll find out how becoming an author changed JJ's life and how his writings are changing other people's lives. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. How would you like to be able to read other people's minds? Well, the next best thing is here. When you know how to read a person's name, you know how the person thinks, feels, and behaves. Each letter in our name holds a key to unlock our true essence. Our name contains both our gifts and challenges in this lifetime. Mnemology Science discovers personality secrets hidden in the placement of the letters of our names, including the first and last impression people remember about us. Sharon shows us how to interpret the arrangement of letters as outlined in her book, Know the Name, Know the Person. Sharon Lynn Wyeth created Mnemology Science after 18 years of research and testing her theories and has supported thousands of people around the world in understanding themselves and others better. You'll enjoy Sharon's unique teachings as she shares her system to learn the gifts behind your given birth name. Even if you don't like your birth name, there are jewels in this book. If you're thinking of changing your name, ready to name your child, or wanting to get along better with others, this is the book for you. 
If you'd like to improve your relationships and change your life for the better, get the book today, Know the Name, Know the Person, or visit www.knowthename.com. That's www.knowthename.com. Take a step back in time and discover old Florida cuisine at Marsh Landing Restaurant in Felsmere, Florida. Enjoy delicacies such as frog legs, gator tail, catfish, and swamp cabbage, or enjoy the more traditional cuisine such as hand-cut Angus steaks, ribs, and seafood. Join us for breakfast with a Southern Flair featuring sweet potato pancakes, biscuits and gravy, and much more. Planning a party? Marsh Landing's private dining rooms can accommodate groups from 8 to 80 people. While you visit, enjoy the historic pictures, artifacts, and stories that line the walls. Marsh Landing is truly a unique experience. Marsh Landing Restaurant, 44 North Broadway in historic downtown Felsmere. Or visit marshlandingrestaurant.com. Marsh Landing, Old Florida cuisine at its best. Lynn Wyeth, and you're listening to Know the Name, Know the Genius in You, which is being heard on xzbn.net and knowthename.com. Our guest tonight is J.J. Dewey, whose website is freeread.com. Now, J.J., many of the things published that you have written has not been seen anywhere else. It's like you've got a new take on everything, and you're seeing things and putting them together where other people are often repeating something that somebody else has said in a new way, but you're actually creating new things. So how did that come about and how did becoming a writer change your life from what you were doing prior to being an author? Well, the old uh, cult maxim is energy follows thought. And my thought is always toward something that is new. And I, I have noticed that A lot of writers, especially in philosophy, just repeat something somebody else has said. And some of the ones that become real successful say the same thing that has been done in the past, but just change the vocabulary a little bit. They just tweak the words, like uh, The Secret, for instance, which was a really big success, copied uh, Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich, just uh, tweaked the words quite a bit, changed the vocabulary, and and presented basically the same message and become a great success. But uh, I'm, that doesn't make me happy, even if I were to become a great success. I don't want to be a success uh, just repeating what's already been done. And so every time I write something, I try to write it with either uh, a new twist, a new insight, or something just totally new. And that's my goal with... Uh, uh, just about everything I write, unless I'm just responding to a question that demands, you know, a response that uh, has knowledge in it that's readily available. You know, I was showing your astrology chart, JJ, and for yeah. everybody out there, you were born on February 6th in 1945 at a location in Oregon that's almost exactly at the halfway point between the North Pole and the equator and almost exact degree of 45 degrees. And what that means for everybody who's not into astrology is that when you draw all the lines across from where the oppositions are and the conjunctions, JJ, your chart comes out to a perfect star of David. Has any astrologer ever told you what that means? I mean, I'm so curious because I've never seen that before. Right. Well, the first time I had a really good astrologer do do my chart, uh, uh, he drew the, up that star David and showed it to me. And he said this was the first one he'd done with a star David in it with a planets. Now others have it with like asteroids and stuff and minor planets, but uh, mine had uh, uh, a connection to the uh, major planets of the time. And <laughs> he he stretched out his hand and he says, I want to shake your hand. He says, he says you must be one heck of a guy. <laughs> <laughs> and then he told me that it was a legend among astrologers that the star David was in the chart of Christ. And I thought, wow, that's pretty uh, flattering. 
uh, I'm going to have to check this out. And so that spurred my interest in astrology. So I, st I studied it for a while and uh, to, uh, enough to understand uh, all the basics of it anyway. So I uh, wasn't really that interested in astrology till I met this astrologer. I'd, and uh, I did find out that it is fairly rare. You know, of course, other people born on February 6th in Oregon uh, also have the star David in their well, chart. They, so They'd need to be born really close to the same time also. <laughs> yeah, and as far as being on the 45th parallel, I checked it out one time where the hospital actually was. Now, Silverton on, in the books is like 45.01 uh degrees and 45 is right in the middle between the north pole and the equator and uh but i checked out where the actual hospital was and it's as about just about as close to exactly 45 degrees as as is possible to get so i thought that was kind of interesting kind of a sign to me that part of my mission is to be in the middle way between the two extremes and see the truth between the two extremes and that's why uh, liberals, for instance, call me a conservative and conservatives call me a liberal because I, I look at both sides and, and try to find the truth. And it may be on the left or it may be on the right. Now, I've read most of your books, JJ, and I would say you do a wonderful job presenting both sides and asking enough questions and giving enough reasoning for either side to really guide people to start to think for themselves. It's, it's really an amazing thing. Um, and each year, so many of your readers like myself get so excited over the material that you've presented that we attend a gathering that you give once a year. Would you tell us how you come up with the topics for your gathering and why you started that? Uh, well, um, Lorraine, uh, one of my uh, avid readers, uh, decided she wanted to get everybody together uh, it's clear back in 2000, and so she uh, arranged uh, the first gathering, and then after that, everybody wanted to have one once a year, so we uh, we have one every year. And as far as how I pick the topics, I don't really think about it till about a month before, and then I start thinking about something I try to... <clears throat> They always expect something new at the gathering, which is kind of get it gets a little bit more difficult every year since I've written millions of years so, or millions of words. So uh, every year I try to come up with several things that are uh, totally new to give to the group that uh, is willing to make the trip to the gathering. Now, some of these gatherings and what you've talked about are free on your website. Is that true? Uh, yeah, we have audio of a number of them on the website that they can listen to free. Okay, now, if they go to just freeread.com, there's a link at the top and bottom for the uh, uh, main uh, index. And that uh, you can go to that index, and by clicking on the various links, you can go to thousands of different uh, articles and audios. Yes, I understand you have over 6,000 articles on there. I mean, I think that's going to long last where nobody will ever run out of reading material if they're, if they're interested in what you've been writing. Yeah, um, I, may have a, I may have a record as to the largest number of original articles on the web. I mean, there's a lot of people just ramble on on the web that have a lot of words. <laughs> but these are, these are like uh, original articles, uh, most of them. In your trilogy book series, The Immortal, the first book is free on your website, freeread.com. Yes, uh-huh. And in this Immortal series, you created a story that presents very unique and mystical teachings in a way that captivates the imagination, as if John was alive today and he's lived all those years and never died. And what philosophy or how would he present things today in today's context? And so... When reading the books, it's very hard, I would think, for most to distinguish what is true out of the book that you're writing, the Immortal series, and what part's fiction. So will you give us any clues on how to determine which parts are true and which parts are fiction? Well, I try to present the teachings as being true, and that's the main thing. And uh, most of the things where it talks about events in my life are true as far as the, some things are 
um, uh, embellished. And so I don't tell people which things are true and which aren't because that creates a mystery that kind of keeps people captivated. But um, I'd say about 98% of the people who read the whole series thinks that uh, I've definitely got some type of source available. That, that's really cool. And it comes from obviously years of reading and really contemplating uh, the re, you know the Bible and other mystical texts that you've read. You know you've also written a book on interpreting the Book of Revelations and the meaning behind the beast and what that really means. Could you tell yeah. us what your approach is in the book versus how most interpret the Book of Revelations? Well, first of all, most people think the Book of Revelations hasn't uh, uh, happened yet. They're all waiting for all that great destruction to come, the comet to come, and wipe out two-thirds of the fish in the sea and all that type of thing. But um, it's much different than people think. And the fact that the... Let me read you the opening of the book of Revelation, just a minute. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Now... It's been 2,000 years, over 2,000 years, well, about 2,000 years since the book was given. And I'd say uh, uh, 2,000 years is not really a, a short time. Yet it says all the things in the book of Revelation are going to come to pass shortly. And so this is the, the, the great flaw in everyone's interpretation of the book. They're still waiting for everything to happen. And what they don't realize is it's already happened. Uh, it says, now it says the revelation of Jesus Christ, and the re word revelation really in the Greek comes from uh, uh, the word uh, uh, apocalypsis, which means the unveiling. So really in the Greek it reads the unveiling of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And what is it that must shortly come to pass? That which must shortly come to pass is the unveiling of Jesus Christ. And who does it, who is it unveiled to? It's unveiled shortly, just like it says, to the person that reads and understands the book. He who reads and understands the book of Revelation will shortly, it will shortly come to pass that it will be unveiled to him the mystery behind Jesus Christ. And what's the mystery behind Jesus Christ? It's the mystery of how we can follow in his footsteps and become like him. You know, there's a great and, debate going on um, about whether he came, uh, uh, Yeshua ben Joseph came as, you know, one of a kind, or he came as a way shore that to show us the way that everybody else can duplicate. So it's, it's kind of like a debate that I hear a lot of people talking about whether he is like an older brother or whether he was deity. Do you have a quick, short answer on that for us? Yeah, when I was uh, in the Orthodox religion, I, uh, I, I, it kind of fell flat with me, the teachings about Christ, because I thought, boy, he's so far above me that, uh, boy, I could never be like him. And then when I realized that I could be like him, then I felt much more motivated to be uh, uh, on the spiritual path. I thought, boy, I can be like him. And uh, the book of Revelation actually tells us how to be like him. And so uh, once the interpretation is uh, given so uh, or understood, so that, uh, that itself was one of the biggest turning points in my life when I realized that Jesus was like me, but just more uh, farther evolved along the path than I was. He was my true elder brother, not an elder God, so to speak, that was so far away from me that I could never be like him. So in your book, The Unveiling, if somebody read that entire book, would they come to that understanding, too, that they could do it themselves like, like Yeshua did? Yes, yeah, so that's the whole purpose of the correct interpretation of the book. 
is, for instance, uh, it begins with uh, messages to the seven churches. And the seven, messages to the seven churches are really seven steps uh, in our progression to be a disciple of Christ. And then after the... Okay, we're going to have to continue after the break. Oh, okay. Stay tuned sure. to Know the Name, Know the Genius in You. This show is dedicated to finding out how to make ordinary extraordinary. After the break, we'll find out some of the different ways to do it. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Gwilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we'll weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Gwilda Wiyaka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Mutual Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. Gibbs A. Williams, Ph.D., is a practicing psychoanalyst, supervisor, researcher, and author in New York City. Much of his life has been dedicated to understanding nature and the uses of meaningful coincidences or synchronicities. His radical and original non-Jungian, non-mystical, non-magical theory of synchronicities illuminates much of the fog surrounding this challenging and perplexing topic. His ideas and manners are fresh, presented in a style that is both entertaining and highly informative. He is also an expert on crisis intervention, specially focused on violence reduction for the police and citizens, mastering anxiety, frustration, and stress without the use of medication, and effectively preventing and treating heroin addiction. Dr. Williams can be contacted at his email address at gwwilliamsny11 at aol.com or visit his website at Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the x Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. True healing must address four levels, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, for us to live joyful and productive lives. We tend to treat three of the four, leaving the spiritual languishing. If you're tired of the same dysfunctional patterns cropping up in your life, soul balancing is for you. Trixie Phelps, owner and founder of Soul Balancing, is a naturally gifted energy healer trained in numerous esoteric forms, including shamanism. Trixie has created a powerful modality that safely and effectively clears your energetic field. A soul balancing session can remove interference, heal trauma, and restore your hope. Contact Trixie for a life-changing long-distance session today, www.soulbalancing.world. Quiet, 
and you're listening to Know the Name, Know the Genius in You. Our guest tonight is J.J. Dewey, who can be reached via his website, freeread.com. J.J., before the break, you were telling us about your writings and about the, the book, The Unveiling. You want to go ahead and finish what you had started before the break? Yeah, like I said, uh, it was a big revelation to me to just get the feeling more than anything else. You know, I've had the theory before, but uh, uh, when the realization comes that uh, Jesus was really just a guy like me that uh, struggled and overcome all things, uh, that ma made me look entirely in a new light, like, uh, well, maybe I can really be like him someday. And uh, so that uh, that really motivated me a lot because looking at him as a God that is so far beyond you that he can come down and do no wrong, everything he does is perfect, is really an antichrist view of him because uh, when you really look at his life, uh, he wasn't looked on as perfect by anyone, even his disciples really questioned him. And his enemies thought he was uh, in league with the devil and uh, a drunkard and a wine bibber, they called him. <laughs> so uh, he you know, was uh, he was looked upon in his day quite a bit different than he looked upon on hindsight by all the religious people of today. I'm sure that your viewpoint that he was just a regular guy, but farther advanced on the trail than everybody else uh, really causes a lot of controversy. So I'm just curious, do you get a lot of mail or a lot of emails or whatever that would maybe possibly fall into the controversial part or hate mail or t trying to tell you that you're wrong? Uh, not so much on that. I haven't put a lot of emphasis on that. I'm just explaining more mostly to you right now that that was a motivating thing for me. But uh, most of my readers are pretty open to what I say, and uh, people that are black and white in religion won't even read anything I say. Uh, I have quite a few religious people in my family, whenever I give them a copy of my books, I think they just burn it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've always stated that you write about principles rather than just facts or data. And I know that you're frequently quoted because I hear other people say your quotes a lot. And one of your popular sayings that is quoted quite often is, it may take a thousand facts to create the understanding of one principle, but one principle can reveal a thousand facts. So are principles, how you're using the term, similar to para, um, parables in the Bible? Is that the same concept or different? A little bit. Uh most of the parables of Jesus illustrate some type of principle. Now, a principle is something that uh, reveals, once you understand a principle, you can reveal all kinds of facts. For instance, let's take temperature. Uh, the temperature is, uh, say, in a square mile, is maybe you might have a, a thousand different temperature readings. And to get them all, you'd have to go uh, uh, put thermometers all over the place. But if you understand how a thermometer works, you can create a thermometer and get a temperature reading an infinite number of places. And so understanding how a thermometer works, the principle behind the thermometer allows you to get temperature readings in billions of different places. Whereas uh, if you just have a temp thermometer in your hand, hand and don't understand the principle, and the thermometer breaks, well, then you're screwed. <laughs> and so uh, uh, the understanding the principle behind things allows you to understand all kinds of facts and data and put them in the right place. And so I, uh, I, I concentrate a lot on teaching principles because then people, when a principle is taught, a principle can't be faked. Uh, a lot of New Age teachers teach... Uh, uh, things with a lot of new uh, uh, names and data, like around Sirius, there might be some uh, number of planets, and on this planet there might be lizard people. I mean, how do how do we know whether or not that's true? There's no way to check it out for sure. But when you teach an actual principle, 
then uh, uh, it just registers with your soul because principles are the language of the soul. For instance, um, the law of correspondence is as above, so below. That's a principle. So if you look at an atom, you think, well, when we look at the microcosm of the atom and then look at the macrocosm of the solar system, there's the correspondence. And so by examining the correspondence, we can figure it out. And this is how uh, they figured out the, the, the configuration of the atom was by using the law of correspondence, they figured, well, maybe an atom is like a small solar system. And when they come to that conclusion, they investigated it and found out they were true. But the difference between the upper and the lower is there's always a twist. The lower, the upper is like the lower, but with a twist because in the world of spirit, pure spirit, where God resides, he says, behold, and this is in the book of Revelation, I do all things new. Now, the religions of the world teach the opposite. They say he just does the old things over and over. But no, in several places in Isaiah and in the book of Revelation, God says he does new things. And uh, so when he creates on a higher level, he repeats a lot of the things on the lower level, but with a twist. Because he always does uh, his creations, his new creations, uh, with a twist, a new twist, so new things can happen and we can have exciting new adventures. So if he's always doing something new, that would imply that God is not stagnant or perfect. Yeah, per perfection is an illusion. And the word perfection in the uh, Bible is mistranslation. Uh, the three words for perfection, and the word that applies to perfection of Jesus means a person that uh, uh, does the job he was given to do. So where it says, the commandment says, Be your, you therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. In the literal translation, it reads, uh, do your job on your level, just as God does his job on his level. Wow, that really changes the meaning a lot. <laughs> yeah, right. So, you know, we're not expected to be perfect like God, which may be a trillion years ahead of us. Now, some of the time in your writing, you refer to something as being relative perfect. What do you mean by that? That's because there's no such thing as perfect perfect. There was another word for perfection, which uh, is used in a negative sense in the Greek and the Bible. Uh, I believe it's Acrobel, if I remember right. And it uh, refers to flawlessness. Now, the flawlessness is uh, seeking that is actually condemned in the Bible. Whereas the perfection, which is uh, where it says Jesus was the author of our perfection and, and uh, be therefore perfect, these type of words that supply to deity means to fulfill the job that you're given to do or you've chosen to do. Uh, but perfection, as far as being flawless, was uh, what gave Jesus a terrible time because the the religious authorities thought uh, Jesus was not flawless, and so they kept accusing uh, him of breaking the Sabbath. And as far as the letter of the law, he was breaking the Sabbath. But as far as doing the job he came to do, he wasn't breaking the Sabbath. He was fulfilling the spirit of the law. And so uh, this this flawlessness really never happens. But we reach a point of relative perfection. Now, one of the best examples of this is computer programs. We uh, You write a computer program, and it's never perfect. But eventually, we, uh, when they release a version, the version does what they want it to do. But it may not be completely flawless, but it's relatively perfect. And this is what happens in all the creations of God. Each atom is a little bit different from every other atom. There's very slight differences. Yet they're close enough to perfection to be called relatively perfect. Can't really improve it anymore. And this is what happens. Once you work on something 
I say a painting, uh, a song, a book, you get it so good. And maybe if you worked another two years on it, you could improve it one more percent, but it's really not worth it. So once you get it relatively perfect, then you quit and then you move on. And this is what God does. And so everything in creation is that uh, is is uh, reached its uh, end point is relatively perfect you know but I, not most, exactly perfect most humans are really hungry for new thought and and thought that challenges their conventional way of thinking that makes sense and so mm -hmm. one of the topics uh, that you talk about is 666 in the bible um and you interpret it so differently than how most people do uh, would you mind sharing that with us in a kind of condensed form? Uh, yes. Um, the um, one thing it says in the in uh, Revelation 13 where it talks about the 666 is that uh, uh, all the ones that have the mark of the beast have the number. They bear the number 666. So not only the beast bears the number, but everybody else bears the number. Now, the greatest Antichrist in our history was Hitler. And uh, what was interesting about Hitler is he actually put a number on the arms of all the Jews that uh, he held captive. But which, uh, which hand did he, uh, which, which limb did he pick, the left or the right, to put the number on? Do you know? I would presume the left. Right, the left. Why do you suppose he picked the left hand? Because the right hand sits by God and the left hand is where Lucifer was supposed to sit. Because the Bible says the beast will put the number on the right hand. And Hitler was familiar with the Bible, so he says, man, I don't want to be identified with the beast. I'm putting the number on the right. <laughs> <laughs> Very clever. <laughs> And uh, no number on the forehead either, because it says he'll also put a number on the forehead. So he's, <laughs> Hitler says, no number on the forehead, no number on the right hand. <laughs> and where did he put the swastika on, the right or left hand, or right or left arm? That I don't know. Uh, left again. Put everything on the left. Now, what's funny about that is that it's all... <laughs> He wound up putting it on the left to avoid being uh, called the Antichrist. But <laughs> the left hand signifies the left hand path, the dark path. So he wound up putting it on the, the appropriate one for him, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Well, but, it, it's, uh, it's funny in its own way, but that was a very sad time in history. Um, stay tuned to Know the Name, Know the Genius in You on xzbn.net and knowthename.com. And after the break, we'll find out what Joseph John Dewey, called JJ, has in his name that assisted him that you may have in your name as well. This will be very interesting as we also find out about his other nonfiction writings. Stay tuned. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 
1-800-800-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. Little children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an 8-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500 plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at Songs and Stories for Soul. Soldiers.us. Help us help a veteran make it through the night. You're listening to the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Welcome back. I'm Sharon Lynn Wyeth, and you're listening to Know the Name, Know the Genius in You. Our guest tonight is J.J. Dewey, whose website is freeread.com. He's taken his writing skills to a level where he's able to convey complex ideas in a very understandable way, just like you've been listening to how he was explaining 666 or a little bit of that. J.J., I've always wanted to know, from your opinion and all the research and the learning that you've done, are we living a predestined life or a life full of free will? What are your thoughts on this? Um, that's a little bit of both. Uh, we have free will and we can determine our future, but there is also certain cycles, just like, uh, your free will doesn't determine whether or not the sun will come up in the morning. The sun's going to come up in the morning, no matter what you think. And we're going to have a seasons, no matter what you think. So we have to work within cycles, but within these cycles, we do have complete free will. We can uh, make our destiny. Now, before we were born, we actually planned our life as much as possible. And uh, there's different uh, signs that we put in our life to give us 
indications as to what we're supposed to do. So we should always pay attention to what's happening in our life because there's different signposts. And uh, But that doesn't take our free will, away our free will. Sometimes we ignore those signposts. Have you ever, for instance, had in your life different signs that you just ignore and you ignore and you ignore and then they become stronger and stronger and stronger until you feel like, well, everything was pointing that I should go this direction, so I guess I better do it. <laughs> and that's because you planned it before you came here to the earth. And uh, But even though we plan things, it's like you can plan a business and some people follow through according to plan and others change the plan. And uh, sometimes we do that with our lives. We uh, have our lives planned through uh, with our in connection with our soul before we're born. And then we come down here and we change it somewhat. But we have complete free will to do whatever we want. What's the basis of your understandings? I mean, how did you learn so much? Where did your divergent thoughts originate? Well, it's by communing with your own soul is the best way to uh, get higher knowledge. Uh, and this is um, in connection with the 666, is that uh, uh, the 666, the number signifies, the number six is uh, the number that governs the emotional level. And the emotional level, we're like a beast. We're like being herded as a, a dumb beast. And the fact that the ones that have the number of the beast are people that can be herded by controlling their emotions. And by controlling and stimulating their emotions, they can be controlled. So we have to arise above that to escape the mark of the beast. And so and going above that, we have to realize that uh, the beast are the voices without that try to take the place of God. And we have um, ministers, we have doctors, we have lawyers, politicians, all trying to be the voice of God to us, telling us what we're supposed to do and think and believe. And that is the mark of the beast, when you're controlled by all these outer voices. When you escape the mark of the beast, you go within and you find the voice of your own soul. When you find that voice, then you escape the, the mark of the beast because then you rely on that as your greatest authority. And that's the closest to infallibility we can get is going within to our own souls. You know, so often people want us to tell them what to do. It's like... Oh, yeah, people are lazy. They, they want to, they, you're exactly right. They want to be told what to do. And that's one of the biggest criticisms I people have of me is that I don't tell them what to do, and they want me to tell them what to do. Well, I know when I'm analyzing people's names for them, and they say, should I take on his name or stay with my maiden name? And I say, this is what it's like with your maiden name, and this is what it's like if you have, take on his name. And then they're saying, okay, so which one should I do? And I think, you've got facts on both sides. Decide which one appeals to you more. But that's when I really started realizing people want to be told what to do and they want other people to make decisions for them. So right. how would you go about guiding somebody in not wanting somebody to make a decision for them? Well, first of all, you're to be commended in seeing that because uh, just telling people the both sides and giving them all the data and then leaving the choice up to them, that's what you should do. So you, you're doing it correctly. Whereas... Many people like the idea of being the authority, so, and they see that people like to be told what to do, so that encourages the authorities of the world to even become stronger and to, to clamp down on things. And so uh, the best thing to do for a true, true teacher is just to give the facts, give the information as they understand it to the highest of their ability, and then... If people reject it, fine. If people accept it, fine. If people can use it, fine. If they can't use it, fine. Just leave it up to them as to how they're going to apply it. How did you discover that you were really good at writing? I mean, uh, like you said earlier, when you started writing, you thought everybody would just, this is wonderful stuff, and you got all these rejection letters. What happened <laughs> or what turned it around so that 
I mean, your books are just captivating. You start and you'd rather stay up all night and keep reading. And so what caused the difference or the shift where you went from that original writing to where you are today with these incredibly captivating books? Well, uh, first of all, I felt really bad that I got all these rejection slips when, well, like, like I said, I started when I was 16 and sent a bunch of stuff in and did a bunch of writing for a couple of years and got all kinds of rejections. And I kind of felt uh, negative about myself, thought, well, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not that bright. And uh, then I was working with this guy that had a four point. He had nothing but A's, and I was pretty much a C student. And uh, when we did teaching together, he had to go back and review everything. Every time we taught something, he had to go review it, and I didn't have to review it at all. I had it in my mind. I thought, what's the matter with this guy? He's, uh, he's supposed to be twice as smart as me, and he's like he's ten times dumber than me. <laughs> 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 and that got me thinking about intelligence. And, you know, there's a lot of C students that have wound up being geniuses in, in a lot of ways. And uh, well, part of the reason I was a C student, because I was always doing other things when I was in school. I didn't pay my... I found a lot of things a lot more interesting than regular school. But uh, anyway, that started me thinking about what true intelligence was. And when I really started thinking about it and observing who seems like uh, possessors of true intelligence and who isn't. It isn't the people that are the flawless ones, so to speak. It's the people that are thinking out of the box. And they're the ones that are, <laughs> they're the ones that are uh, true intelligent, true, truly intelligent. The people that ask the right questions. Another thing that made an impression on me, I was teaching a Sunday school class one time. And I asked the class, I says, um, it was about 30, 40 people in the class. And I asked, if Jesus were to appear right here, right now, what question would you ask him? And nobody raised their hand to ask him any question. Nobody had a question to ask Jesus if he were to show up right then. And that just boggled my mind. I thought, what's the matter with these people? I'd have a zillion questions to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody had any question of significance. Finally, when I picked on somebody specifically, they had a really a milk toast question that uh, uh, to ask him, you know, that just how can I be a better person type thing. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, I was, uh, that really got me thinking about uh, uh, me in relation to other people that, uh, well, maybe I'm, maybe I do think a little different than average. If you could maybe change they're... one thing about what people understand or how they look at the world, what would that be? Well, it's to not be subject to the mark of the beast, which is just to not go along with what you're told is the truth. To think about everything, to question everything. It's like the X-Files says, the truth is out there. But to find that truth that is out there, you have to question. Yeah. Uh, the, the main difference between the great innovators of the world isn't the basic intelligence, because we all have the same potential. All of us have the same potential. So the main thing that's different is in asking questions. What can I do, or how can I move forward, or what's the purpose of X, Y, Z, or whatever it is you're interested in? Uh, asking questions rather than just reading and soaking in information. Reading and soaking in information doesn't do anything unless you ask questions about that information. Once you ask questions about it and, and let it sit, it's called a, a, a seed thought. Let these seed, seed thoughts sit in your mind. And one of, the, one of the great benefits I got when I was in the, my religion was I memorized a lot of scriptures. And, and I find I'm that... i you off there. Everyone, you will oh. be surprised and pleased when you experience JJ's work. Remember, his website is www.freeread.com. 
JJ excels at writing in a way that he causes his readers to think and consider new ways of looking at things. This ability to think outside the box and to formulate a new pathway is found in the first letter J of your name. If your name starts with a J, you too can use brilliance to reframe a person's perspective. You can hear more about names at any time at www.knowthename.com. Yeah.